Good morning, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, your host, the content executive here at Higher Things. And joining me again today is my good friend, David Zills. David, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I had a extra day this weekend. So today I am off of work, meaning I will still be doing work playing catch up, but you know, comfier. at least, at least it's catch up. Yeah. You know, I can, I can go someplace nice to do it, you know, and yeah. not have to be in the office. The, there, there's something to be said for a change of scenery once in a while. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. So we talk apologetics whenever you come visit and um, that, that's sort of the, the defense of our faith. Um, and, and today we're going to do a really, really cool one um, because there, there's a lot of sort of um, argument over what did Jesus actually think that he was trying to do here. And, and so this is why, um, you know, the, the person of Jesus is co-opted by so many movements and even so many faiths. But Jesus himself actually has some stuff to say about it. Um, and one of the things that uh, people like to sort of cherry pick and say is Jesus never explicitly said that he was God. And we'd like to take a little bit of contention with that, but more, there's other stuff that Jesus said about himself that that's worth paying attention to, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a loaded topic. Who did Jesus think he was? Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's the question. So, uh, you know, last time we introduced the topic saying there's, there is the argument we'll be making is a two-step argument that Jesus was God. And it's a historical argument. We're not or arguing based on theological premises or theological assumptions were making the argument based on historical data. So it's a historical argument. And the two-step argument start, the first step is the claims of Christ, second step, character of Christ. So you mm -hmm. have to look at the claims of Christ. Who did he claim to be? Because if he, if he, you know, if he sent a letter to Peter saying, by the way, I don't know why you guys are starting to think I'm God. I'm totally not God. Like, <laughs> don't ever say that, you know, that would be like, that'd be pretty compelling evidence that he's probably not God. Um, maybe he was ambiguous, you know, so we have to look and say, who did Jesus think he was? Cause if he did claim to be God, you know, last time we talked about how that limits our options for the theories that really work for who Jesus is. It's hard to say he's just a good moral teacher. We have to kind of be forced to take an extreme view when he makes these extreme claims. Right. So, um, you're right. Jesus never comes out quite and says, I am Yahweh, like verbatim. And so, how you know is there a way to make a case that Jesus is God? Are we forcing this on the data, or is this inherent, kind of, and obvious to anyone who looks, who looks at it? And we're going to look focus on the four Gospels, um, both the Synoptics, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John, and it, it's there in all of them. You know, some people have claimed John is a later gospel, and mm -hmm. that's the only one where Jesus says things like, I and the Father are one, and before Abraham was, I am. In the synoptics, the earlier gospels, Jesus never says this kind of thing. And so, you know, this is taken to support the idea that belief in Jesus' deity evolved over time, and it wasn't there in the beginning. But that's that's not the case, as we'll see. It was there from the beginning, um, at least as far as the four gospels are concerned. Um so um, a bit of a story behind the approach we're going to take. Mm -hmm. I was actually in Wittenberg, Germany on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. It was pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. Um, is, uh, yeah. I, uh, and I got to spend the day with uh, three, three men who are really great Christians. One of them is Dan Wallace, who's probably the leading expert on the textual um, history of the New Testament, you know, the manuscripts, how do we know that what we have in our Bibles today is what was originally written? And then his friend, Ed Komisevsky, um, and then uh, Alex, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Blagojevic or something like that. Really, really cool guys. But Ed um, was telling me the story about this book of his that I had picked up, but not read yet. And the book is what I'm going to be basing this on. It's called Putting Jesus in His Place which is kind of a provocative yeah. title. And then the, and then the subtitle It'll tells sell. you, yeah. And then the subtitle tells you what they really think, you know, the case for the deity of Jesus. Okay. Um, but, um, but I asked Ed about it and I said, you know, what's the story behind this? And he said, well, for a long time, the key book, Christian book defending the deity of Jesus was a book by Josh McDowell from the eighties. Um, and Josh McDowell, great guy. He really invigorated my faith, kind of gave me hope that there were answers to hard questions. Um, but he's not a New Testament scholar. Um, and so what happened was uh, people, it was kind of a proof texty approach, which is kind of the standard approach to, you know, how do we know Jesus was God? Well, let's 
pull out some specific verses here and there that seem to claim that. And what happened was there were people from like Jehovah's Witnesses and other cults that were looking at those texts and going back to the original languages and kind of deconstructing the argument and saying, you don't have to understand this as a claim to deity. That's that's actually not what it is. And so all these apologists around the world were calling into the scholars saying, we don't know what to do with these arguments. And Ed, mm -hmm. you know, was one of the guys who, so to speak, was picking up the phone. And so he was, he's uh, down at Dallas Theological Seminary with Dan Wallace. And he basically set out to write a book. He said at one point he had a 300 some item bibliography that he read the whole thing and then tried to distill it down the academic literature into layman's terms into a book that would be accessible, but also scholarly. So it's pretty ambitious. And the this book, Putting Jesus in His Place, is what resulted. Okay. And there's actually a second edition coming out where they're going to expand it. The first book emphasizes the case for Jesus' deity. The second edition is going to keep that stuff, but also respond a little more intentionally to counter arguments such as Jehovah's Witness or, you know, like Bart Ehrman, the idea mm -hmm. that belief in Jesus' deity was a Christian idea that evolved over time. Jesus would have never agreed with it had he heard it. You know, and so the second edition is going to respond to these objections a little more intentionally. So I'm I'm kind of excited to see that. Yeah, but be cool. But uh but yeah so the argument that they make is um kind of a holistic argument. So it's not a proof texting argument where you find one passage here, one passage there. The argument they make is to look at the New Testament holistically and to basically show that Jesus fulfills um, a lot of the characteristics of God. And so they, they actually talk about five aspects. It's the acronym is HANDS, H-A-N-D-S. -A -A so Jesus H, Jesus shares the honors of God, the attributes of God, names, deeds, and the seat of God's throne. And so that's kind of their outline. And it shows kind of the takeaway is that at the end of the day, if you know, if you know your Old Testament context, especially mm -hmm. the deity of Jesus is practically on every page of the New Testament, including the gospels, including the synoptics. And so it's it's much more comprehensive argument than the proof texty Josh McDowell approach. Mm -hmm. So I want to give people an introduction to this way of making the case because I think it's, you know, it's really within the last, you know, less than a decade that this has really been popularized. And I think it's a pretty compelling approach and I think it's the way we need to approach this thing. Awesome. So uh, H, honor. Yeah. So Jesus shares the honors to God. So there are some honors that you should, you know, owe your father and mother, you know, fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. There are some honors due to like the king or the emperor, or the president or the government. Um, but there are some honors that in Jewish thought were only reserved for Yahweh. And so in particular, Jesus in his temptation, when Satan says, I'll give you everything if you worship me, Jesus quotes the Torah, the Jewish scriptures and says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So Jesus is affirming worship and serve Yahweh only. Now the serve word, I mean, we're supposed to serve each other, have a servant heart, but it, it specifically refers to performing religious rituals. Um, so it's, you know, something, it's the kind of service you would do, like, say, at the temple, that kind of service. And so Jesus is saying this is only for Yahweh. He's agreeing with the Old Testament. The interesting thing, though, is that people worship and serve Jesus, and he seems okay with it. And so that's puzzling because he says you should really only do this for Yahweh. And then people do it to him, and he's like, okay, sounds good. Yeah. You know, so, for example, um, I might have to pull up my notes here because um, – but people worship um, Jesus um, after he walks on the water in Matthew, people worship mm -hmm. him. And then people worship him at the end of Matthew, right before his ascension. And in the latter case, he even affirms that their worship is appropriate. He says, well, while some are doubting, presumably doubting whether it's appropriate to worship Jesus, he, he says, no, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So if you're not going to worship the ruler of everything, you know, who are you going to worship? So Jesus is saying, yeah, I'm the one you should worship. And then serve, um, we'll talk more about this uh, later in the argument, but Jesus 
used the term son of man to -hmm. refer to himself, which sounds like he's saying he's only human. But if you look at the way Jesus used this, it's actually a reference back to a Jewish prophecy from the prophet Daniel, where Daniel says, behold, I saw one like a son of man descending on the clouds and everybody's going to serve him. And um, the word for serve that all people are going to serve the son of man is an Aramaic word, which is rendering religious service um, in honor of a deity. So Jesus is saying, I'm the one that people are going to serve in a religious way at the end of time. And by the way, this is only reserved for Yahweh. So it's not a direct claim to God, but it's still pretty clear. And so those are two you know, classic examples of Jesus right. claiming to be um, deserving of the honors that only Yahweh is deserving of. And there's even some more nuance to that because there are other times throughout the synoptics where uh, people try to uh, essentially worship God as, as a Jesus, as a king, uh, after the feeding of the 5,000, for example, um, when, when they really like the earthly deeds that he's doing, the miracles, and they just want to keep him around to do those things. Um, but he, he's not content to be sort of um, worshipped as they would worship a king. And back then, there, there was sort of a, a different kind of worship ascribed to, to, to uh, rulers. Uh, he doesn't want that kind of worship. But you're right, the, the kind of worship that is reserved for God alone cool let's go with it. yeah yeah so this seems odd that he would rebuke satan for trying to worship non-god and then when people worship him he says that's okay unless he thinks he's god which is right. the conclusion so let's go to a attributes um lots of that could be said here let's just talk about some highlights so one is um the idea that Jesus is the image of God. This is word. This is language that's used by the apostles in their epistles. Like Paul says, you know, he's the image of the invisible God. Um, he says in Jesus, the fullness of de- deity dwells bodily. Um, but this language goes back to Jesus in the Gospel of John. There are numerous places where Jesus says, "If you've seen me, you've seen the Father," meaning what the Jews would have understood as Yahweh. Um, so he's saying, you look at me, you're looking at Yahweh. Um, and um, so this makes sense. You know, in our Christmas episode, we talked about the John's prologue where he says, no one has seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the father's side, referring to Jesus has made him known. Jesus is the bodily manifestation of who God is. Um, but then we can get into some specific, specific attributes. So um God is eternal and pre-existent. Jesus claims to be eternal and pre-existent in a way that mere mortals are not. So there's the famous passage in John where he's getting in an argument with the Jews. And they're like, who do you make yourself to be? Are you greater than Abraham? And he kind of says, well, yeah, because he says, you know, before Abraham was, I am. Um, I was, past tense, I am, present tense. But also if you dig into the original Greek. Yeah, this is the fun part. Yeah, when he says Abraham was, the Greek word is different from the word when he says I am. There are two different words in the Greek, and the the kind of word that's used for Abraham was means came into being, so he began to exist, mm-hmm. whereas the Greek words that's used for I am is kind of like I always existed. It echoes the Septuagint, trans- which is the Greek, the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures where mm-hmm. God says to Moses, you know, Moses says, what's your name? Who should I say your name is when I go to the Israelites? And he says, I am who I am, ego, Amy in the Greek. Yes. And that's what Jesus says here, ego, Amy, before Abraham was, came into being, I am. And this actually echoes another Old Testament passage where in the Psalms, it says, before the mountains came into being, God is. And so there are a number of play Mm -hmm. number of ways grammatically in an old testament context here that jesus is saying yeah i'm pre-existent in a way that is only that is not true of created things right and when you sort of recognize when you keep reading in john after he claims to be i am uh they tried to stone him and it's not because he said he was old um but because he used the name of the lord that 
you are not allowed to say. Um, so if you, uh, for example, if you're if you're deeply Jewish, you don't say Yahweh. Um, in, in fact, these are, are words that are not pronounced. You, you would say Adonai, you would say Lord. Um, and, and you can even get into sort of how we got Adonai and, and Jehovah and all these words, but it's because the, the, the Jewish people will not say the name of the Lord. And, and they get so angry with Jesus because he says ego, I mean, he, I, I am. It, he, he doubles down on it. it it's sort of re-emphasizing the point. Uh, they get so mad because he uses the divine name name and he applies it to himself yeah that 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 gets into the context of judaism which is really important because it'd be one thing if jesus were hindu to say i am a god okay mm -hmm. join the club lots of lots of gods out there but in <laughs> jewish monotheism which was the only monotheism at the time um christianity was obviously just being born just a continuation of Judaism, really, and Islam wasn't yet on the scene. Um, and so there's this sense that you, the, the oneness of God is sacred. You don't question that. You don't infringe on it. You certainly don't claim it for yourself. That's deserving mm -hmm. of death. And so when Jesus does this and people respond saying, you're deserving of death, that's a clue as to how they're understanding that his claims are infringing on the sacred, the sacredness of God. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that's really important. One last attribute of God we can hit, um, Jesus is omnipresent. So he says, where two or three have gathered in my name, there I am with them. So, I mean, sometimes we'll say, you know, I can't make it to the family reunion, but I'm with you guys in spirit. Is that what Jesus is saying? Well, I think we can understand this a little more by looking at a Jewish saying that's recorded a little later where the rabbis were recorded as saying, um, let me see if I can get it right, two that sit together and are occupied in words of Torah, the Jewish scriptures, have Shekinah among them. So it's exactly the same as what Jesus is saying, except instead of where Jesus says, where you're gathered in my name, the rabbi said, where you're gathered with the words of the scriptures, and where the rabbi said, Shekinah, the manifest presence of God, Jesus says it's my presence. He's equating his presence with the manifest presence of God. And then at the end, the, and then at the that's in Matthew's gospel. And at the beginning and end of Matthew's gospel, there are two more examples. Um, Jesus is said to be Emmanuel, God with us, which, you know, in the original prophecy, that just meant God is with us. That doesn't mean this, per this baby to be born is God in the initial example. It just means God's with us and this baby's a symbol of that. But at the end of Matthew's gospel, he says, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so the implication is that Jesus is God's present with his followers forever. Um, and so you see this a number of places where Jesus claims attributes that humans don't have but Yahweh does right and this isn't you can sort of dive in, into more of the nuance too at the end of Matthew because he says um not just lo I am with you always into the end of the age but if you are baptizing in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit and teaching people to observe the things I have commanded namely the Lord's Supper which is his body and blood lo there I am with you always um that that Jesus isn't simply uh, omnipresent but he is omnipresent with his people a and this this is, is God's love, God's will being exercised as, as well. Um, that, that God just isn't sort of like, you know, God is in the trees and God is in the rocks and God is in uh, like all the, the pagan religions would do, but this is, this is God fulfilling his promises to his people. And again, adding power to the words that Jesus gives throughout his ministry as well. Yeah. You, you bring up baptism and communion as, which are religious rites done in honor of Jesus, that goes back to the worship and serve God, mm -hmm. doing religious True. rites in honor of Jesus. You know, something you're only supposed to do religious rites in honor of Yahweh, and Jesus says, do them in honor of me. He puts himself mm -hmm. there. So yeah, yeah lot, lots to dive into there. Let's move on to names to end. So there's an explicit one where Thomas, um, you know, we, we get tough on Thomas for being doubting Thomas, but I honestly think we're too hard on him. I think I his reaction is really under, like, I think he's the normal one out of the bunch in many ways. <laughs> and Jesus says, you know, he, he shows him the evidence that Thomas needed to know that the disciple, the other disciples weren't like playing a trick on him. Mm -hmm. And Thomas's response is to say, my Lord and my God. And Jesus responds in a way that is like, yeah, that's an appropriate reaction. Yeah. yeah. You believe good. Um, another example, which is maybe a little more subtle, but you, it again goes back to that, 
relationship between, you know, not saying the name Yahweh in the Jewish culture. But Jesus says, you know, not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only who the person that does the will of my father. Well, the Lord, Lord is interesting. Kyrie, Kyrie in the Greek, in the going back again to the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures, which was popular in Jesus' day as a translation. Anytime you see Kyrie, Kyrie, it's always a substitute for either the the Hebrew Lord Yahweh or Yahweh Lord, mm -hmm. but it's never in reference to anyone besides Yahweh. So in the context of what Jews were used to hearing, the double Kyrie, Kyrie was a name for Yahweh. And Jesus mm -hmm. is saying, this is a correct way to refer to me, but it's not enough. You also have to do the will of my father. You can't just acknowledge that I'm Lord. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, another, there are a lot of also, you know, not direct names of God, but Old Testament metaphors for God. There are a lot of metaphors, especially throughout the Jewish prophets. And one of them is that God is the husband to Israel. And Jesus, in many of his metaphors, talks about himself as the bridegroom for God's people, the husband. He talks about the wedding feast at the end of time. And so he's putting himself in a relationship with his people in a way that only God has that relationship. And the apostles pick up on this. You know, if Ephesians 5, one of Paul's letter, he says, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know, as Christ is a, the ideal bridegroom to the church, that's our model for how husbands should relate to wives. And so there are a number of metaphors like this where um, Jesus Use, he co-ops Jewish imagery from their scriptures, from their prophets, and he applies it to himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so D, the deeds of God, obviously miracles come to mind, but interestingly enough, I mean, we've talked about miracles. Jesus isn't the, isn't the only one to do miracles. People are doing them today. People did them in before his time, you know, look at Elijah, Elisha, Moses, um, and so there, there have been some scholars who have analyzed the different types of miracle workers, and one categorization is to break it down into, um, what are the categories, Bear, bearers of God's power, mediators of God's power, and petitioners of God's power. So bearers means I have God's power in me. Mediators means it's working through me. Petitioners means I pray to God and he acts. Yeah, so most of the time when we think of miracles, especially today, we think of the petitioner's case. You pray to God and he acts. So the interesting thing is Jesus never asks God to heal. He never says, God, would you please heal? He just he heals. And he never heals in anyone's name, but his apostles, after his ascension, heal in his name. Um, so Peter says, Jesus Christ heals you at the beginning of Acts, for example. Jesus is doing what, what God does. He's not... Um, he's God's power isn't just at work through him, but he has it in his person. Um, and this becomes especially explicit um, in Luke when John the Baptist sends people to Jesus and says, are you the one who is to come, the Messiah, or should we look for someone else? And Jesus famously says, you know, look at what you see in here. All these miracles are being done. And this is a fulfillment of a prophecy, which he quotes. You know, we talked about that when we talked about Craig Keener's book on miracles, how a lot of those things are still being done in Jesus' name today. But Jesus applies this to himself in the context of a prophecy from Isaiah 35 and 61. And the interesting thing is in that prophecy, you know, John the Baptist's question is, are you the one who is to come? And Jesus says, I'm doing the things in the prophecy. Well, what's happening in the prophecy? God is the one coming to his people. So again, Jesus is putting himself in a role that God was supposed to fulfill, implying that Jesus understands himself to be God. Um, other deeds of God that I think are actually more compelling than the miracles, because like I said, lots of people do miracles, even counterfeit miracles. Mm -hmm. um, but one, one notable example is where Jesus forgives people's sin. Right. So, you know, there's the people lower this paralytic through the roof to Jesus because they want him to heal him. And Jesus responds, he's, he's got big, you. he's got bigger purposes yeah. than just this man's healing. And he says this, your sons, your sins are forgiven, which um, the, the Jews then take to mean he's claiming to be God, which, you know, 
I think we have to kind of think, you know, what does it mean to forgive someone's sins? If you, if you hit someone on the highway and cause them lots of damage to their car and you get home and you're telling your neighbor about this and your neighbor says, well, I forgive you, you your neighbor's, yeah. your neighbor's totally out of bounds. It's not his place to forgive you because he wasn't the one damaged. And so we can forgive sins that were done against us. But Jesus forgives this man's sins as a blank check. Mm -hmm. Well, who's the only one who was sinned against every time this man sinned? It's Yahweh. And so Jesus is saying, I am the only person who can forgive all your sins and I'm doing it, which is why the Jews were so upset. They understood this connection between forgiving all sins and the fact that only God can do that. And then Jesus, to affirm that he's really serious, that he has this authority, he says, so you know that I have this authority, I'm going to do a miracle. And that's when he heals him. Um, so Jesus forgives sins in a way only God can do. Jesus also teaches on his own authority in a way that only God does. He doesn't teach like the rabbis. He doesn't prophesy like the prophets. He just says, amen, amen. I say to you, it, my word is enough. Um, so I know we're getting close on time. So let's cover the S real quick. The seat of God's throne is what the S is for. And there's really one key passage here. And Ed has given a talk on this that it'd be cool if we could share the link, but it was at his church. But it, it's a deep dive into the key verse. So, you know, people will say, you know, John's gospel is the late one. That's where Jesus claims to be God. In the early ones, he never does this. That's not true. You know, there's debates today as to which gospel was written first. Um, you know, we don't know because they didn't have dates attached to them. But the majority view is that Mark was written first. Um, even if it wasn't the case, Mark was still early by by most scholars accounts even non-christian scholars and interestingly in mark jesus makes some of the strongest statements to being god so in particular in the climax of mark's gospel jesus is on trial it's a undercover trial at night the authorities want to put jesus to death everybody knows this jesus knows this and they need to do it secretly so that there's not a riot mm -hmm. and they're looking for witnesses to that will, by Jewish law, two witnesses have to agree to give the death sentence, and they're not finding two witnesses that agree. And so finally, the high priest takes matters into his own hands, and he says, okay, you know, this witness thing is taking too long. Let's just hear what he has to say about himself. And he says, you know, I, on oath before God, who do you think you are? Are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? And again, blessed is code for God because Jews don't want to say yeah, the, name. the name of God. And so Jesus says, um, I am. Now in other gospels, his words are recorded as you have said so, which is kind of a, in the language of the time, a way to deflect responsibility back to the person asking the question. But lest we have any confusion as to who Jesus thinks he what was, he doesn't just give a yes or no answer. He then says, um, what is the exact quote? And you will see the son of man, there's that title, seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And so well, why did they react this way? He said, son of man, clouds, right hand of power. What does all this mean? And it's important to frame this in terms of important Jewish prophecies about the coming Messiah. And there are two in particular. One is from Daniel 7, where it says, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there's the clouds part. There came one like the Son of Man. There's the title. And then the other passage is from Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And so Jesus fuses these two, I believe, in a way that had never been done before, in a way that's unmistakable that he is claiming to be Yahweh. So let's break the three parts of that down. Son of Man, um, again, this is not a statement to humanity. Um, in the Daniel prophecy, um, the Son of Man possesses all judgment, authority, and rules an everlasting kingdom, um, and everybody serves him in a way that is only appropriate for um, to serve a deity. So the Son of Man is a title of is a divine title, even though it describes someone who has a human form. Um, and then the sitting at right God's right hand from Psalm one ten. 
in a Jewish mindset, to be in God's presence is like something you don't ask for because it kills you. Yeah. You know, it, it, the, the Jewish people would have been familiar with the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum of the temple, where one guy on one day under very specific ritual conditions is allowed to enter. And anybody who breaks those rules dies. And Jesus says, I'm going to go into God's presence and sit down. It's kind of like he's saying, I can live in the Holy of Holies. I'm like, that's like my home. So it, this was like startling to a Jewish audience. And then finally, the clouds of heaven, the third part in the Old Testament, coming on the clouds is used exclusively of divine figures, either Yahweh or pagan gods. So Jesus is saying the people that write on clouds are gods. I'm going to write on the clouds. I'm going to judge all people as the son of man. And I'm going to sit down in God's presence, which is something no human can do. And so it's not surprising why the Jews say, what further witnesses do we need? He's claiming something that no one can claim unless they're God. And in there, the, his audience is understanding Jesus is most certainly not God, which is why they condemn him to death. And so, yeah, the H-A-N-D-S. Honors do God only, attributes only God has, names only God has, deeds only God does, and sit, sit on the seat of God's throne. It's a holistic argument. And the book goes into detail. This has just been a highlight, um, kind of a highlight reel, but it's a holistic argument that shows God doesn't just say, I, Jesus doesn't just say, I'm God. He paints the picture in very explicit, multifaceted ways. Right. It's hard to come away with any other conclusion if you're if you're listening in faith. I mean, yeah. even just listening. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. yeah. Which is which is why people that didn't have faith in Jesus were polarized about him. They were like, "He has a demon. He's crazy." Yeah. There were there weren't very many neutral people about Jesus either. You worshipped him, or you hated him, it's, or it's you were puzzled, be. or you were puzzled by him. Yeah, yeah. And this is actually sort of the the other side of just sort of cherry picking verses, which is what the the holistic approach is sort of um, rises above. Is that if you're going to throw out ninety percent of the New Testament, I guess you can sort of have a few quotes from Jesus that that sort of suit your particular need. But when you actually read his, his entirety of, of of his narrative of his gospel, then yeah, he, he's he's claiming more than just sort of this one point you're trying to to prove somebody wrong on. Yeah, yeah. So you know. This, this is the argument that as Jesus is recorded in his teachings, he claims to be God. As we talked about last time, we have to say, what are the options left to us for who Jesus is? And there are really only three. Either he made this up and he knew he made it up, in which case he's a liar, he's a con artist, or he's crazy because he really believes it. And who believes that they created everything and is sane? Um, or these words were put in his mouth afterward by his followers. So they're recorded as coming from him, but he didn't actually say them. So, you know, next time we'll have to look at those three options and see which one makes the most sense. And then the fourth one is that he really exactly. is who he claimed to be. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. David, thanks so much for joining us. Sounds good. Thanks, Harrison. Hey, have a good one. You too.